All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us to the fifth section, uh, fifth session of Plague Literature in the Time of Coronavirus, which is hosted by Lawrence Technological University. Um, my name is Paul Jossen. I'm Associate Professor of Literature here at LTU, and I will be your host for the evening. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank a few people, uh, particularly Dr. Phil Vogt, who uh, has organized this uh, excellent series of conversations, um, and to the College of Arts and Sciences for sponsoring it. Um, we've also had tremendous technical support from Scott Lehman and the e-learning crew. Scott is right there. Hi, Scott. Thanks again for doing this for us. Um, before we get started, I just want to make a quick announcement about our sixth and final session, which will be held next Friday, May 15th, from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Uh, the text we'll be reading there is Susan Sontag's essay, AIDS and Its Metaphors. Um, I'll also be hosting that event, joined by Dr. Kenny Fountain from the University of Virginia, Dr. Sheila Tiam from Michigan State, and Dr. Tim Warren from Wayne State University. Um, tonight's panel is entitled Eros, Healthy and Diseased, and we're going to be looking at Plato's Symposium and Gabriel Garcia Marquez's Love in the Time of Cholera. Before we even begin, though, I'd like to offer a kind of alternative second title that might help us get thinking about these texts. Um, I, instead of just thinking about Eros, Healthy and Diseased, we also might think about Eros, Health and Disease, uh, which suggests the many ways in which Eros kind of gets metaphorically represented as a kind of disease, but also helps us link to the different forms of social relationship that both arrows and disease kind of produce or agitate or create or generate. Um, so I want us to try to think as expansively as possible here. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce all of our panelists and then I'm gonna explain the format and we'll kick things off. So we have um, four panelists tonight. Uh, Dr. Michael Goyette is an instructor of classics at Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida. Hello, Michael, uh, where he teaches uh, the ancient Greek and Latin languages, along with courses on ancient medicine and medical humanities, ancient science, women and gender in antiquity, and more. In addition to these topics, his research also examines tragic drama, especially the tragedies of the Roman playwright and philosopher Seneca, the reception of ancient literature and ancient history in the modern world, and pedagogy. His most recent scholarly publication is an online article, an article in the online medical humanities journal, Synapsis, titled COVID-19 uh, Novel Virus Classic Scapegoating, which sounds like a must read after today's panel. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Michael. Uh, our second panelist is Dr. Omar Vargas, who is a Colombian assistant professor of Spanish in the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures at the University of Miami. Omar completed his PhD in Spanish American Literature at the University of Texas in Austin and his undergraduate studies in mathematics at Universidad Nacional de Colombia. His research interests focus on the relationships between scientific discoveries and developments and the narrative fiction of Latin America and the Caribbean in 20th and 21st centuries in several authors. Omar's first book, Cantidades Ejicados de uh, Cirogísticas de Sobresalto, La Secreta Ciencia de Jose Lezama Lima, I tried, I apologize, uh, will soon be published by Purdue University Press, so congratulations on that. He is currently exploring the transition of the scientist to a writer in the case of Argentine author Ernesto Sabato. He has published in the journals The Borges Center, Revisita Revolución y Cultura, Nuevo Revisita del Pacifico y la Habana Elegante. Thank you, Omar, for joining us this evening. After earning his doctorate in intellectual history at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Phil Vogt came to Lawrence Tech, where he has taught for 21 years. He published a book on John Locke in 2008 and said everything he has to say on that topic. His interests have since shifted to ancient history and philosophy, particularly the Platonic dialogues. Thank you again, Phil, for organizing and for joining us. Uh, Phil's role tonight will be somewhat off camera. He's going to be moderating our chat function uh, which I'll explain in just a moment, and uh, taking participant questions, as well as chiming in from time to time. And then finally, again, my name is Paul Jossen. I um, uh, teach here at Lawrence Tech primarily in the core curriculum. I also am uh, the co-director of the Humanity and Technology Lecture Series, which I founded and uh, direct with my colleague, Dr. Franco Globu. Uh, my primary scholarship is in modern and contemporary literature, focusing on poetry and poetics, 
My first book was entitled Writing in Real Time, Emergent Poetics from Whitman to the Digital, and that came out with Cambridge UP in 2017. Um, currently, I'm working on two projects. Uh, the first is a book on contemporary literature's use of public language. And the second is uh, the Wiley Blackwell Companion to American Poetry, which I am co-editing with uh, my collaborators, Mary Balkin and Jeffrey Gray, both of Seton Hall University. So let me just say something about our format and then we'll kick it off. So I've asked Michael and Omar uh, to give us some introductory comments on both of our key texts, sort of introducing them and situating them for all of us. Um, then our panelists will start a kind of open-ended, freewheeling conversation about the issues that these texts raise. We sincerely welcome and hope for audience participation, and here's how that's going to work. There is a Q&A button that is at the bottom of your screen. Um, the chat function has been disabled just for the sake of simplicity. If you'd like to uh, pose a question or a comment for us, please type it into the Q&A uh, button and uh, Phil will um, uh, then convey your questions to, uh, to us. And um, he may ask you if you would like to um, actually share your, converse, uh, your comment verbally so that we will be hearing other, from other voices as the conversation unfolds. So we have about an hour and a half, which is plenty of time for us to talk and discuss and disagree and engage these works. So I'll hand it over to Michael who will introduce us to the symposium. Thank you for that introduction, Paul. And uh, I'd like to thank Phil and the other organizers for inviting me to participate in this conversation. Uh, so some background information about Plato's Symposium, a very famous text of the Western canon uh, that maybe you're familiar with, but I'll, I'll kind of give you some of the essential background information real briefly. Uh, it was written around 385 to 370 BCE. So this is kind of at the very end of the so-called golden age of Athens, or some would even say after the golden age of Athens had just ended, Athens having just lost the Peloponnesian War in uh, 404 BCE. Uh, the title itself is interesting and I think very relevant for this occasion. Uh, symposium comes directly from Greek, sum, a prefix or conjunction meaning together or with, plus posion meaning drinking. A symposium is literally an, an occasion of drinking together or a drinking party. And that relates to the setting of this text, which was a drinking party that uh, may have actually occurred or may not at a house in Athens circa 416 BCE. That's, that's kind of what uh, the his historians have narrowed it down to possibly, but it may be completely fictional or it may be highly fictionalized. We shouldn't take uh, the speeches in this text as a verbatim record of anything that was ever actually said, uh, but the attitudes that are represented are representative of real people that lived during that time period. The text is narrated by a figure named Apollodorus, who relates the story of this drinking party to uh, to uh, some people that he encounters on the road. And the drinking party itself was attended by a group of prominent Athenian men, all upper having upper class status in ancient Athens. Uh, and there were also some slaves in attendance and some women who uh, mainly played the flute, served as entertainers and perhaps uh, courtesans. Uh, each of the seven main speakers in this text gives an encomium, that is a speech in praise uh, of eros or love. It's, or at least it's intended to uh, be in praise of love. Some of these speeches kind of go a little bit off the rail. Some of them are given a little bit in a slightly drunken state. And some of them are actually in certain ways critical of eros or uh, I said the word love, but uh, it's a tricky word to translate from Greek. Desire or sexual passion may be more appropriate. I think we're going to get into this more during the discussion probably, but uh, the term love in English often has really, you know, quite pleasant connotations for many people. Uh, but eros in Greek literature and Greek culture was often not perceived that way. Uh, with a capital epsilon, a capital letter, Eros could also refer to 
the god, a divine figure, Eros, uh, who the Romans called Cupid. You're probably more familiar with this figure as Cupid. Uh, the, and uh, regarding some related linguistic issues, the Greeks had a very highly developed vocabulary of love slash desire slash passion. There was eros, which I, I talked about, uh, but there was also the term philia uh, that means like brotherly love or friendly love, the love of a brother or a sister or a, uh, perhaps of a, just a friend. There is a term storge, meaning uh, devotional love, kind of love that, that, require, that maybe involves a sense of obligation. And then there's the term agape in Greek that sometimes uh, in, in, uh, the New, in New Testament writings, it was sometimes used in reference to love of God for man and love of man for God. So there can be like kind of a Christian sense to agape. Uh, and it can also mean alms or charity. The word that the word for love or desire that most commonly occurs in Plato's Symposium is eros. Uh, philia gets used a little bit too, but it's mostly eros that these speakers are uh, mentioning. Uh, the seven speakers, the seven main speakers in this text, there were other people in attendance who uh, get mentioned or uh, seem to have been present. <clears throat> Uh, but the seven main speakers are all based upon real figures from Athenian history. Uh, but as I said, we shouldn't take this text as like a verbatim record of something that was ever actually said. The seven speakers are Phaedrus, an Athenian uh, aristocrat and associate of the famous philosopher Socrates, Pausanias, a uh, legal expert, Eryximachus, a physician, and Eryximachus is actually the one who proposes that love should be, or eros should be the topic of conversation at this discussion. It's interesting that that idea comes from a doctor, kind of uh, in connection, you know, thinking about the theme of this talk or this discussion. Uh, the com there was the comic poet Aristophanes, uh, who wrote a lot of surviving, tra or a, a, he wrote a bunch of comedies, a uh, number of which survive. There was a tragic poet also named Agathon, and he was the host of the drinking party. The symposium occurred at his house. Socrates was present, the famous philosopher and teacher of Plato. And finally, Alcibiades, an Athenian statesman, orator, and general, and kind of a, a highly desired, highly volatile playboy in ancient Athens. Uh, the reason I mentioned the occupations or, or kind of uh, interests of each of these figures is because arguably each of their ideas about desire are shaped by their by their walk by the walk of life that they come from by the kind of occupation that they're engaged in uh just as today uh someone's uh someone's personal background might influence the way that they think about love uh, many of the speeches idealize male homoeroticism, especially pederastic relationships between adult and adolescent males in differing ways and for different reasons. Uh, I'm not sure how much that will uh, be relevant to our discussions today, but it's, or it's an important feature of this text that uh, I don't think should be overlooked. And since we're discussing this particular text and since it's a Friday night and near the end of the semester, a trying semester for many of us. I'm going to raise a glass as we participate in the symposium of our own. Cheers. Fantastic. Thank you, Michael. Um, so I think now we'll turn to Omar, who is going to talk a little bit about uh, love in the time of cholera. Hi. Uh, thank you, Michael, for the introduction to the symposium, and thank, thank you, Phil and Paul for inviting me over and for having me here. Um, I would like to mention some generalities about love in the time of cholera. Um, so I'm gonna, I have some, uh, some notes prepared, so I'm gonna go through that. Love in the Time of Cholera by Gabriel Garcia Marquez was first published in Spanish in 1985 and in English in 1988. An English language movie adaptation directed by Mike Newell 
was released in 2007. In extremely simple terms, the story follows the basic plot of a young man who meets a beautiful young woman. They fall in love with each other, but he loses her because she marries another man. And eventually, after the husband dies, they reunite and live happily ever after. Only that this reunion takes more than 50 years to materialize. The characters involved in this love triangle are Florentino Arisa and Fermina Daza, the original young couple, and Juvenal Urbino, the wealthy husband. The linking of love and age is an important one and constitutes a distinct thematic emphasis of the narrative. Uh, talking about the meaning of eros, and in this case, the, the word amor in Espanol or in Spanish, comes from Latin amare, it means to love. And amare itself probably has a Proto-Indo-European origin, possibly deriving from ama or am, that it ha comes from mother. So it sounds like, uh, apart from, from the Greek, in which we have different kind of love, this is more oriented to maternal love. Oh. In, in, in a way. The most influential work on the theme of love in Spanish literature, before this one, is El Libro de Buen Amor, the book of good love, one of the masterpieces of uh, Spanish poetry. It's a semi-biographical account of romantic adventure by Juan Ruiz, the art, art priest of Ita, the earliest version of which dates from the 14th century. The book consists of stories, each containing a moral and often comical tale. It can be seen as a heterogeneous collection of diverse material united around a supposed autobiographical narrative of the author's own love affairs, which is represented in one part of the book by the episode character of Don Melon de la Huerta. In it, all the layers of Spanish low medieval society are represented through their lovers. Um, in Love in the Time of Cholera, the two male protagonists, and I think this is very important, Dr. Urbino and Florentino Arisa, whose lives are linked by their relationship to Fermina Daza, enact to the limit 19th century ideologies of scientific progress and romanticism, respectively. So this all this tension that can be easy to, or can be seen to understand the, the, the book. The novel juxtaposes beneath the thematic uh, surf surface not only two different male characters with two different worldviews, but also the, the tense coexistence of two social projects. The first of this articulation corresponds to the project of modernization and is actualized in Dr. Urbino, a professional man of refined tastes educated in Europe who enjoys great social prestige. The second articulation is that represented by Florentino Arisa, the exaggerated Criollo romantic who um, is actually in the novel through progressively more uh, archaic models. But pro both projects coexist in the time of cholera. What is the meaning of time of cholera from the Garcia Marquez's perspective. It's an expression that refers to a period of Colombia of natural violence when progress have not yet managed to control social evils like city sanitation, political turbulence, or natural evils like sickness. Because of this conventional link between love and illness, that's important, love and illness, the novel again conceals his basic problematic. Love is seen as an illness, but not only as a mental ailment or a spiritual or emotional one, but as a physical one too. Just like cholera, it might be infectious and lead to death. That's another very important component that I would like to highlight. Despite his undying love for Fermina, Florentino Arisa sleeps with innumerable women, though he remains convinced that he's saving himself or her for he can never love another woman the way he loves Fermina. Florentino uses sex as an addict with a narcotic. It is the one means by which he's able to forget his headache and his desire for Fermina, the woman who is the source of all his anguish. Dr. Juvenal Urbino believes in modernity and progress. This quality combined with his concern for social welfare 
leading to reform the citywide medical system and to become a local celebrity. Admire for his ability to stop the cholera epidemic. He is kind of the Anthony Fauci of this novel, if you want to. <laughs> a present example. He meets Fermina Daza when, as a young daughter, he is called on to examine her because she suspected of having cholera. Dr. Rubino examines Fermina and concludes that she is suffering from food poisoning. And that is when he falls in love with her. It is only after one year back in the city that Dr. Rubino sees his first case of cholera, a patient who dies within four days. He ordered the schooner on which the patient had come to be quarantined and tells the city to stop using the cannon because it was believed that shooting a cannon could stop cholera in those days and in that place. Although 11 more cases are reported that year, Dr. Rubino establishes strict quarantines and medical supervision, which keep this case from evolving into a crisis. Dr. Rubino tragically dies at age 81 after attempting to, to get his parrot out of his mango tree, only to fall off the ladder. After the funeral, Florentino, now 76, proclaims his love for Fermina, now 72. And she eventually gives him a second chance. The couple go, go on, on a boat cruise. Fermina panics because she does not want people she knows to walk on board and see her on a trip with a man who is not her husband. Florentino understands this and convinces the captain to sail with a flag indicating cholera on board, which allows allows them to be the only passengers on the ship and to make no stops on their trip. Florentino decides to stay on the ship forever with Fermina so they can enjoy each other's company and defy as long as they can the threat of death. And that's pretty much a general summary of the plot. Just a couple of more things and then I think we can start the discussion. Garcia Marquez was always fascinated with epidemics. For example, he participated in the adapted screenplay from the novel of Daniel Defoe, A Journal of the Plague Year, published in March 1722. The result was El Año de la Peste, The Year of the Plague, a Mexican motion picture film in 1978 and released in 1979. The plot of the movie is about a dreadful sickness found in a Mexican town. A doctor tries to alert the authorities when he discovers his epidemic nature. No one listens to him, and soon the illness spreads. The government tries to manage the information in order to prevent terror. But there is also the insomnia pandemic in 100 years of solitude. Most of the inhabitants of Macondo have been infected by, the, by an insomnia plague, which had been brought by Rebecca, an orphan girl who mysteriously, mysteriously arrives in town and is spread through the consumption of prepared candy animals. The main consequence of this situation is that people begin to suffer memory loss. Most of it manifested through the loss of the name and notion of things. But Melchiades, the gypsy, returns to town and brings the antidote to insomnia. So this is pretty much the summary of the main things, just to start the discussion involving love in the time of cholera and, and the topic that we are discussing today. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you both for that. Um, again, I'm not, I don't want to uh, dictate the terms here. So, you know, at, at any point, just sort of jump in and pose questions to one another. But I, I will start us off um, maybe by taking the bull by the horns in terms of the relevance for these two texts for our current moment. Uh, our, our, our motif for this whole seminar series is, um, you know, plague literature, literature in the time of coronavirus. And, you know, there was some thought into these two texts as a pairing that might, would be relevant in that sort of mini syllabus. Um, but maybe the way to pose the question to both of you is, how has our current situation maybe shed light on these texts for you, or perhaps cause them to be seen in a new light? That would be one way to approach the question. There might be other ways to think about the linkage, but I, I do want to get down to the details of the works, but I'd like to start with that because I'm sure there might be some listeners who are saying, why these texts now? What, what do these texts have to offer us now? 
Um, you want to start, Michael? Uh, sure. Go ahead, please. So, uh, one thing that I'm very struck about that really strikes me about uh, the speech that Socrates gives in the symposium is where he famously describes Eros as the child of poverty and plenty. Uh, that is kind of like, uh, we could think of this as kind of synonymous with deficiency and excess. So desire, we might think of as being linked with uh, one extreme or another in the way that uh, Socrates describes, describes it. The metaphor that he describes there is very open-ended and, and kind of leaves a lot of room for interpretation. So I'm, I'm just gonna kind of go with this idea of deficiency and excess. And one thing that it made me think about, maybe also in relation to love in the time of cholera, is the relationship between desire and class. Uh, and kind of one, one thing that's been, I've been thinking about just really in, in the last week or so is, you know, as we go through this so social isolation and as people prepare to uh, lose loved ones or have already lost loved ones, the question that comes to, one question that comes to mind is um, who gets to experience love or eros in the context of an epidemic? And maybe how, um, also how may our current situation uh, change the ways that people express love or the opportunities that they have to pursue love? Uh, those are some questions that, they're, they're questions, I'm sorry, I don't have more answers there, but those are questions that I've been, have been kind of percolating for me, just coming out of this comment that Socrates has in, in which he describes desire as the child of poverty and plenty. Yeah, yeah. I would like to say that uh, one of the main things that struck me about, in general, Garcia Marquez's work, but in this particular novel, is the, the social implication that he has when he confronts these two characters and these two situations, these two projects. He is reading uh, all of the social implications of inequality, of uh, the way one tried to get into or to, to ascend in the social, uh, or social status to change that situation. And uh, he's reading, actually, he's reading uh, Colombian history and in general Latin America. And because of that, he's also being very universal. That is one thing that I would like to say. And also, I would like to mention the fact that he, his very poetic approach is using cholera, not in the, in the literal meaning of this the, uh, pandemic or epidemic, or, but also as a symbol of, uh, of um, different other circumstances in terms of inequality, social struggles, political struggles. So he's used to, to represent that. And finally, another thing that, that is connected to all of this is that he's using it also to express uh, mental problems. I mean, love is also a mental situation and he's dealing with mental problems, mental illnesses too. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, in Love in the Time of Cholera, right in the first chapter, when describing the period in which uh, Dr. Juvenal Urbino is about to die. He is described, he's portrayed as a person who is entering the first stages of dementia by forgetting things, by needing to write stuff on paper, which is a very common uh, theme in all of his work. So I just want to mention this to start a discussion or question. So. Yeah, this idea of love being uh, sickness is yeah. very con consistent with how love is portrayed in the Greek mythological and literary tradition, although the, the symposium is different in certain ways, but because there are all these different speakers that have different mm -hmm. nuanced ideas about what desire is, uh, but in general in the Greek literary tradition and the Roman literary tradition, uh, desire is, is generally portrayed as something that is uh, a sickness that overwhelms the mind as well as the body, and that's uh, an infection that festers in you and uh, 
and also something that is contracted kind of through a, a, a process almost like contagion. The Greeks and the Romans didn't have a real sense of contagion. You know, germ theory came about much later. Actually, maybe it's interesting to think about um, Love in the Time of Cholera as a, a novel that's set in a time period not too long after the advent of germ theory uh, in the 19th century, but um, just maybe you can go back to that. But um, in the Greek tradition, um, love is sometimes portrayed as something that that you can track through being struck by an arrow, like the image of Cupid or Eros's arrows that penetrate the body. And exactly. it's kind of like a metaphor of contagion. Um, and it, it's portrayed as something that is contracted from externally and that imperils your health mentally and physically. Uh, mm -hmm. There's some other kinds of things going on in the symposium, like I said, but I think these some of these ideas that we see uh, and that you're mentioning in Love in the Time of Cholera have a an even older history that they hearken back to. And actually, if I could make a comment on that, that it seems to me that um, uh, Omar's reference to uh, the Book of Good Love as a medieval text could be a bridge between that classical world and what Garcia Marquez is doing here, right? Because um, the medieval and early modern notions of love as kind of a sickness that affects the mind and the body, you know, the arrow goes through, in, through your eye and lodges in your heart, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that those traditions were kind of revived in European literature uh, in, in medieval and courtly romances. So it, it's fascinating to think of love as sickness as kind of a through line connecting the classical world to a text like Love in the Time of Cholera. Yeah. yeah. If I could jump in. Please. It, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so um, several of you have said that the Greeks treat love as a kind of illness. I think specifically Plato treats it as madness, as divine madness, right? Um, I, I think there's a, such a famous passage in the Phaedrus where Plato describes what happens to the soul and the influence of love. It's sort of an etiology of the, the, the disease of love. Um, what I'd like to do is just take a second and compare it to um, something from Thucydides' um, description of the plague in Athens and show you this, the similarity between these descriptions, okay? So this is Thucydides describing victims of the plague in Athens. And I'll make this quick. People in perfect health suddenly began to have burning feelings in the head. Their eyes became red and inflamed. Inside their mouths, there was bleeding from the throat and tongue, and the breath became unnatural and unpleasant. The next symptoms were sneezing and hoarseness of voice, and before long, pain settled on the chest and was accompanied by coughing, etc., etc. Now, this is interesting for the symposium for a couple of reasons. Eric Simicus, one of the speakers in the symposium, is a doctor, right? A physician, but he's a particular kind of physician. He's a physician in the, tra in the tradition of Hippocrates, of the Hippocratic Oath, right? He's a physician who subscribes to the theory of the humors. And in his speech on love, in his speech on love, he says, in fact, um, bad things are necessary as correctives to good things, that a healthy person is balanced, right? Okay, so here we have with Thucydides a non-Hippocratic description of the effect of plagues. Thucydides never talks about the humors, being out of balance, he simply gives a precise description of what's in front of his eyes as he sees people dying from plague. Now, compare that to this passage from the Phaedrus, all right? Um, the newly initiated, that is initiated into love, who has had a full sight of the celestial vision when he beholds a godlike face or a physical form which truly reflects ideal beauty, first of all shivers and experiences something of the dread which the vision itself inspired. Next, he gazes upon it and worships it as if it were a god. And if he were not afraid of being thought an utter, utter, utter madman, he would sacrifice to his blood as to the image of a divinity. Then, as you would expect, after a cold fit, his condition changes and he falls into an unaccustomed sweat. 
He receives through his eyes the emanation of beauty by which the soul's plumage is fostered and, and grows hot. And this heat is accompanied by a softening of the passages from which the feathers grow. Passages which have long been parched and closed up so as to prevent any feathers from shooting. He's speaking of the feathers on the wings of the soul, okay? Anyway, I can, it, you should read it on your own. It's a beautiful, famous passage. But what, what interests me is that, um, several things. That, um, first of all, the specific kind of, of illness that love is, is madness. And it's a divine madness. It's not undesirable. Um, it makes me think that many of the best things in life could be called disease, like pregnancy. Pregnancy is terribly hard on the body of the woman who gives birth to the baby. And yet no one would say we can dispense with pregnancy. Well, love, love can be very hard on the person who experiences, but we also call it a pinnacle of life, right? So on the one hand, it, it's a disease, but it's called a disease with a wink, with a sly wink because we all know it's desired and it's one of life's pinnacle experiences, right? Now, um, Eric Simicus is the third speaker and he's a doctor. And as Michael said, there are seven speakers, right? There's seven speakers and six of them give wrong answers to the question of what is love. But if you haven't read the symposium, you should read it because you read the first speech and you think that's the most brilliant thing I've ever read about love until the next one is more brilliant still. And the third is better than the first two, but they are all wrong for specific reasons. Some of them are sophistic speeches. Some of them are medical speeches. Some of them are poetic speeches. None of them are philosophical speeches until we get to Socrates and Diotima, right? Anyway, um, I think I'll get back to that later in the evening. Oh, I wanted to, before we went any further, I wanted to say, um, when they call love a disease, um, they're not they're, they're by no means talking about something that is bad. They're talking about something that is, um, I, I meant to ask Michael about the etymology of the word disease, but it's diseased. You're taken out of your life of ease, right? right. Um, you're, taken out of, you're taken out of your normal life. And you experience this new thing which alters you and, and uh, under which you lose control. Yeah, I was going to mention that, right, it's literally a lack of ease, dis-ease, right? It's not necessarily negative. It's just uh, not an easy state to exist in. Uh, but regarding the issue of the humors, uh, as some of you may know, the Greeks had this idea that health consisted of having a balance of these four humors that they thought preponderated in the body. Blood, phlegm, bile, and black bile. Health is a state in which they're balanced. Illness is when, they are, when there's a lack of balance, when there's a deficiency or excess again. There goes kind of back to that idea of poverty and plenty, too much or too little produces uh, something that's a form of disease, perhaps like desire. In any case, each of the four humors are associated with certain forms of illness. Uh, so there's this idea in the Greek humoral system, which was extremely influential in up until the 19th century even, uh, that an excess of blood would make you more prone to lovesickness. Blood is associated uh, with, with love. On the other hand, there's a humor called, which we translate as bile, kole, that is associated with kind of irascibility, anger, that is the root of the word cholera, cholera, cholera. So I, I wanted to go to Omar and ask him about, you know, you mentioned some of the kind of symbolic notions associated with the term. Um, are there linguistic nuances in Spanish that we might be missing uh, without knowing the language? Yeah, I mean, the word cholera is also synonymous of rage. You are really angry. Mm -hmm. So it's not only like the condition like this uh, uh, physical illness, but it's also sort of a, an emotional response uh, to certain circumstances. So he was playing with that double. So the title self. could kind of be understood as love in the time of rage almost? It, 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 not exactly. Obviously he's referring to cholera, but I mean, cholera is, mm. I mean, like the female, uh, la cholera, which is, um, one thing, and el cholera, 
which is a different thing. So, so that's pretty much what the, the distinction is. Same spelling? <laughs> when I first said, uh, and this is very naive, but when I first heard about it, I never knew about cholera as a, as a pandemic when I was a child. When I first heard the word cholera, I thought it was somebody being angry. <laughs> oh. mm -hmm. That was my, 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 my old. That's very Greek. Reacting for the first time to the word. I mean, my first reaction to the word was like thinking uh, like that. But obviously, once you get to know, because in those days there were there was no cholera. Oh, actually, the first the, the cholera episode that he's referring to, he's based on the story, actually happened in 1849. It was like because it was a sort of a pandemic that went. That yeah. went. That, that's right around the time that germ theory started to gain traction. So, so, but then he, he, I mean, actually, I guess about 20 years ago, there was another outbreak in Colombia of cholera, mm -hmm. as I remember. Right, yeah, I remember. I had a student from Colombia who wrote about that for a medical humanities project in one of my classes, uh, but. Um, well, and actually it's worth noting that, you know, cholera still exists and it's still associated with parts of the world that are still developing or uh, lack certain forms of sanitation. Uh, I was just curious about this in preparation and it's still considered a pandemic and roughly 30 to 100,000 people every year globally die of cholera. So I think that's uh, like if we were to historicize that on a global level, Michael, that gets back to the plenitude and right. uh, poverty dialectic that disease enters in, you know, places into this. Right, that's part of what I was Wait, thinking. Omar, Omar, we can't hear you. I don't know if, is your mic? Oh, sorry, uh, can you hear me now? Now we can hear you, yeah, go ahead. I was just about to say that, I guess it's very intentional that he chose, he chose like this cholera because it's more like a poor people kind of, it's affecting more poor people because of the sanitary conditions. So, so it's re a reflection of poverty more than, for example, I mean, obviously this coronavirus is affecting more uh, poor people, but it can affect anybody in, in a way, you know? But I suppose it, it you could say the same thing about love. Those days, or even today, is more like likely to happen in Colorado to, or to have outbreaks in poor places where people is there because of this, and they, they don't have like uh, water or sanitary conditions to, to cope with that. Yeah. So I guess he was like, emphasizing that to a certain extent. Um, I would like to mention something uh, uh, that uh, related to what Paul was making the connection between the classical and the medieval. And, um, and, and I think I'd like to read this, if you don't mind, it's very short, because a couple of days ago, the New York Times published in his opinion section, I don't know if you were aware of this, a letter from Rodrigo Garcia, the son of Garcia Marquez, who is also a filmmaker wrote on the occasion of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the letter is entitled, A Letter to My Father, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Mm -hmm. There are some there that I think are very useful for the discussion. So it's going to be like very, he said, he wrote, not a day goes by that I don't come across a reference to your novel, Love in the Time of Cholera, or a read on its title or to the insomnia pandemic in 100 years of solitude. It's impossible not to speculate about what you would have made of, of all of this. You were always fascinated with epidemics, real or of the literary imagination, as well as with things and people that return. He also see like, like a, a pandemic with a comet that it comes and goes like every certain time. You weren't born yet when the Spanish flu pandemic scorched the planet, but you grew up in a house where storytelling reigned and were a plague. And were, were a plague, like ghosts and regrets must have made for good literary material. But here's the connection that I wanted to emphasize. You often spoke of Daniel Defoe's a Journal of the Plague Year as one of your favorite greatest influences. But until yesterday, I had forgotten that even your favorite or favorite, Oedipus Rex, hinges his effort to end a plague. It was always the tragic irony um, of the king's fate that was at the forefront of my recollection. But it was the plague that unleashed the forces that precipitated the outcome. You said once that what haunts us about epidemics is that they remind us of personal fate. 
despite precautions, medical care, age, or wealth, anyone can draw the unlucky number. Fate and death, many a writer's favorite subjects. And he finishes with this. In the meantime, the planet keeps turning and life is still mysterious, powerful, and astonishing. Or, as you used to say with fewer adjectives and more poetry, nobody teaches life anything. I, I was thinking about the connection with the classical that you were. And re relating to this idea that um, the disease is pervasive and that we are susceptible, uh, I have a passage from Eric Simicus's speech in the symposium that I think is relevant. For those who might have the text with them, this is section 186A to the beginning of 186B. My translation is by Robin Waterfield. Um, but this is what uh, Eric Simicus has to say about uh, love or desire. The body of every creature on earth is pervaded by love, as every plant is too. It's hardly going too far to say that love is present in everything that exists. You could say that one of the things I've noticed as a result of practicing medicine professionally is that love is a great and awesome God who pervades every aspect of the lives of men and gods. The word there, by the way, that's translated as awesome, denon, could also be translated as terrible. The, the Greek word has multiple connotations. But uh, I was struck here that, well, firstly, that these ideas about desire are coming from a physician, like a physician gets some special kind of access or insight into what people desire. Uh, and perhaps today physicians get to, you know, in our current situation, physicians get to find out about what is really most important to people in a way that others might not. They get some special kind of insight into the human psyche uh, in a sad and, and uh, unfortunate way. Um, but then additionally, just the way that it is described is so per pervasive reminds me of this, in, this virus that's going around. It's everywhere. It's a, it's a, it's a, an infection that is widespread, pervasive, and uh, well, as Eric, Eric Simicus describes it, difficult to avoid, uh, present in everything seemingly. Uh, so I just find, you know, I just find this language, this imagery, you know, resonant with uh, both this idea that disease is per pervasive and we're all susceptible, as well as the current situation. I'd like to actually um, triangulate that with a, a passage from, um, is, it, is it diotima? Is that how one pronounces it in the Greek? Diotima. Diotima. So diotima's speech actually um, suggests something similar. I'll just read one line. This is from 207b uh, when she's talking about reproduction. And Phil's already mentioned reproduction uh, as being a, um, a central factor in thinking about um, positive elements we might, we might associate with um, bodily dis-ease, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but she says that, you know, footed and winged animals alike all are plagued by the disease of love, right? And she, she specifically refers to it as a disease there, but she's specifically referring it to animality, right? Our, our animality, our embodiedness. Uh, so I think that's another interesting moment of connection that goes back to the relationship to death and mortality, which is also there. But before we continue, I really feel the need to make a comment about this because um, one of the things that has put me at disease as I've been thinking about this panel is the risks of using disease and illness as a kind of metaphor or descriptor of things that are also positive. So on the one hand, I understand the, the analogy and the, the value of the analogy. On the other hand, I can imagine someone watching our conversation today and say, yes, but, you know, there are doctors who can't sit around talking about, you know, the disease of love and drink a glass of wine right now. There are people who, you know, even in my city, lack water to care for themselves and practice adequate hygiene in the face of, you know, what's real human suffering. Um, and I don't have it. I don't really have an answer for this question, but I'd be curious to see if any of you would be able to comment on how to acknowledge the kind of material reality of our conditions now, while also maybe giving an explanation for the kind of value of the intellectual work 
that texts like these provide? Because I do think they have value. I mean, I have my own answers to this question, but I was curious if other people had thoughts on this. Before we do that, before we do that, um, we, we, are, we are quoting from Plato's writings without distinguishing between the speakers um, who we are supposed to recognize are wrong and the speakers who we are supposed to recognize are right. Eric Simicus is a bad doctor. He's a bad doctor. In his speech, he cites Asclepius, who is a recently introduced barbarian go um, god, a god of healing. The theory of the humors it, it, that, that Asclepius um, um, believes in it is, not, is not accepted by Socrates, right? We, we have different kinds of bad medicine in the symposium. We have the bad medicine of quack doctors, and we have the bad medicine of sophists. Um, Agatha. Phil, but Phil, I'll uh, interrupt you though, because I would argue that in-, in Actually, hang on, I'm not quite finished. Okay, um, go ahead. Agatha, so Agathon, um, who is the first one to offer a speak, the, the occasion for the symposium is Agathon has won the award um, with his play. He's won an award for the year. But historically, he's associated with Gorgias, Gorgias the sophist who wrote the famous Encomium on Helen. In the Encomium on Helen, speaking of Helen of Troy, Gorgias says she was out of her mind to run with Paris to Troy, and she could have been restored to health with speech. Sophistry could have been the medicine that would have um, brought Helen back to her senses. So what we have in the symposium, are, we have one wrong answer after another, right? Now, Diotima is the voice of authority. She's the voice of authority, but when she speaks about beautiful things and the effects they have on us, she expects us to use them as steps on a ladder leading ultimately to the transcendent beauty, the, 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 um, the spectacle of the good itself, you see, the Plato's Republic, when we're told, when Socrates explains how we use sensual pleasures as stepping stones to deep understanding, okay? Now, I'm getting a message that my connection is unstable, um, internet connection, so I hope you can hear me. Um, so all, all I do, what, it, it occurs to me with, with six wrong speeches about love, it'd be interesting to try to categorize, categorize novels, right? Works of literature. Okay, which wrong presentation of love does that fit into? And which wrong presentation of love does that fit into? You see? Um, I, I okay. don't, I wanna, was that your point or did you, did you want to finish up? Um, that's my point, but I also have a question from Vivian. Um, and and Vivian's before we, question before is quite long. Wait, before we get to Vivian's, Vivian's question. Vivian's question is quite long. I bet she would happily join the discussion. Before we get to Vivian's question, I want to just push back slightly and offer a different take on the symposium. And it, it's very brief. The thing that strikes me as interesting about the different speeches is they're not, in my reading, Socrates' final speech synthesizes elements that each speech brings into, bit, into play, right? So Socrates' Diotima's account also talks about love as disease. Diotima's account also talks about love as the desire for beauty, which actually doesn't show up until Agathon's speech. So what I'm more interested in, I, I'm not saying that they're, that they're not philosophical, but I'm interested in the fact that Socrates seems to be acknowledging truths in each one of these different speeches in his final encomium. And I, I'm also to add another twist to this, maybe we'll get to this later on. I'm really interested in the way love is always a problem, right? So it's, like, it's always kind of problematic, which is why it, it elicits kind of good responses, wrong responses, half correct responses, ambivalent responses. Um, you know, a, a, a broken clock is right twice a day, as the joke goes, right? Which doesn't justify keeping broken clocks along, along. But I don't think we should write off each of the other speeches as being, you know, completely wrong. They, they, are, useful, they, they are useful in their wrongness. Now, Vivian says she, she'd happily join the conversation. She warns us there might be small child sounds. Perfect. Um, Paul, just uh, real quickly, uh, if I could chime in, uh, regarding, regarding Diotima, I didn't mention her when I was giving my introduction because her, I'm glad she's come up, but her speech, she doesn't speak herself. She, 
English. Like her ideas are conveyed by Socrates, which kind of gives us a feminine perspective in this text, although, albeit secondhand, uh, it's important to acknowledge Diotima's role. She's a, she's a female philosopher who may be purely mythical, may not have actually existed, but Socrates uh, tells us about how she influenced his ideas about love, supposedly. Um, Socrates, of course, the real historical figure. Regarding the question you had about, like, how, I'm trying to remember how you put it, but basically, uh, you know, what is what is the use of kind of this kind of discussion? When well, the risk. I don't want. I don't want to call. I don't want to say it's yeah, not valuable, okay. but it's just sort of like the, like how to be careful while we're having this kind of conversation. Yeah, I think it's super important, uh, and just you know, kind of going back to what I was saying regarding um, class considerations, this idea of poverty and plenty. I think that that is something that's important to keep in mind. How does how, how does the situation affect the way that people can express love or find love if they have any opportunities for it? But then also, uh, I think that, you know, all of these different ideas and discourses about love can and should lead us to think about how we express love and how we define love in these unusual times. You know, what, what does it mean to love someone, to show love when you can't physically be in a room with another person, perhaps? I love that. That's fantastic. Thank you. Love. I love it. Arrow. <laughs> I love that arrow. <laughs> Guys, we have quite a queue. We have quite a queue of questions. Let's take some of them. Let's start with Vivian. Okay. Hi. Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for this discussion. Um, so the figure of Diotima kind of leads to my question. Um, I'm wondering what you all think about the difference that's made in the symposium between male-female love and male-male love. Um, so um, Phaedrus um, in sections 180 to the 182 ish um, differentiates between male-female love as uh, more base less noble, more lustful, and in my translation, common, um, whereas male-male love is considered noble, older, wiser, um, and also there's, uh, in my uh, translation, um, it's articulated as the difference between common Aphrodite and heavenly Aphrodite. Um, so I'm just wondering what you all think about this differentiation um, and what that might have to do with disease or illness. Um, and you know maybe we can also draw some some uh, connections to the Marquez as well. Thanks. Who wants to tackle that? Um, I'm happy to try. Uh, so you mentioned Phaedrus, Phaedrus's ideas. I'm going to refer to a couple of other speeches, Eryximachus again, and then Aristophanes. Uh, that describe love somewhat differently. Uh, Eric Simicus is less has less to do with sexuality than Aristophanes, but um, let me just make sure I can find the relevant quote here. Um, well, basically, I'll just summarize. Er Eric Simicus uh, kind of defines love as a reconciliation or harmonization of opposites. We might think of he doesn't specifically go into male and female sexes as being opposite, but this, you know, these ideas that Eric Simicus have are kind of very much in keeping with ideas about health in Greek, in, in Greek medicine at large. Uh, you know, this idea that in order to have a balance that is health, you need to have the opposites balanced. Uh, so that would seem to be kind of uh, heteronormative, we might say. Uh, on the other hand, Aristophanes has this really fascinating idea about the origin of love. It's sometimes called a myth where he says that there were originally three different types of entities. You can think of one as basically like a man smushed up against another man. Uh, the next is a female, a woman smushed up against a woman. And a, uh, the third is the androgynous pair, a male and female combined. Uh, in Aristophanes' story, these original human beings that existed were split apart in order because they were thought to be too powerful. Zeus came along and split, had them split apart with this thunderbolt and 
he, and Aristophanes goes on to explain the idea of desire or love as the attempt for people to, uh, to get back with their original pair. To get, so this is both heteronormative and homonormative, you could say, this idea that you know, it's healthy to join back up with the original person who is part of your pair that you were split apart from, and health is combining that. And so Aristophanes is kind of not taking too many sides in that debate, but on the other hand, he suggests that uh, the male-female pairs, uh, heterosexual pairs tend to be more philanderous, less uh, you know, prone to more infidelity. So I don't know if we should correlate that with disease, but he does kind of insinuate that, uh, that heterosexual desire is more pejorative, uh, but he defines all of these attempts to reunite, whether, you know, regardless of sexuality, as uh, you know, striving for health that is difficult to attain because it's, it's hard to find your, your natural soulmate. Can I, Mike, can I ask a follow-up to that? Maybe to, to situate it within the Greek ideals too, because honestly, my exposure to ancient Greece is really through Plato. So I often can't distinguish between what was a broadly accepted Greek idea and what is a Platonic idea, right? And so for me, um, I also read um, Vivian's question, which I think is absolutely a fantastic one, through, um, again, Socrates' recounting of Diotima's speech, where she highlights and privileges the soul's desire for the form of beauty in contrast with the body's desire for pleasure, which leads to like normal sexual reproduction. So reproduction happens in both, but there's this kind of spiritual reproduction that is higher than just sort of physical reproduction. Right. And so in Plato, I can see which would become a, you know, a long historical trajectory of associating femininity with the body and material reproduction and the realm of necessity and masculinity with like the ideal, the world of the forms, the idea of reason. Is that an idea that already exists in Greek, in Greek culture before Plato or is Plato's work to kind of like make this something that we now associate with the Greeks, Greeks and then associate with Western epistemology in general? those ideas about like masculinity and femininity and male bodies and female bodies. And then mapping on to kind of like the, you know, like the, the spiritual or the, the rational versus like the physical and the, and the material. Yeah. Yeah. This connection between physicality and disease and like the body and, uh, you know, bodily lust and disease is very commonplace in Greek literature, I would say. It's not unique to Plato. What is, what is more unusual is this speech by Aristophanes. There's no precedent for it. And Aristophanes is a writer of comedies. The whole thing might be a joke. It might, you know, this whole myth that he concocts that there's no precedent, precedent for, you know, no version that comes later might just be like a one-off joke that he told at this drinking party. But what is kind of, uh, that does, what does kind of really strongly relate with uh, to other aspects of Greek culture is this pers per per this strong connection between bodily desire, kind of like carnal desire, and disease. Uh, whereas, you know, with Socrates' speech in the symposium, uh, he's trying to describe a type of love that transcends that, transcends the bodily, and is therefore not diseased. Um, but kind of, you know... Bob, uh, Bob Powell is in the house. I am. Hi, Bob. Hi. Okay. Um, I have a question. I'd like to hear each of you suggest what we can take away from tonight's books to help us render our own experiences of COVID-19, including social distancing, which keeps us away from many of those we love. In, in Wallace Stevens' words, how do poets help us live our lives? Um. I would, like to, I would like to try to give an answer to that regarding Love in the Time of Cholera. I think like the, the, the book, Love in the Time of Cholera, one of the first things that suggests is perhaps the idea of how to deal with love. And the time of cholera is associated with a time of transformation, both social, political, and uh, economical, and everything like that. So in a way, how to love in the time of cholera 
is equivalent to how to uh, love in the middle of difficult circumstances, how to deal with that. And perhaps the answer that Garcia Marquez proposes to that question is how to write poetry in the time of, of these uh, difficulties. And the character actually, all what he does, whatever he's, I mean, he, he started like working, uh, I don't know, as a clerk or something, and he has to write letters, but he ends writing all the time love letters. So in a way, I guess he suggests that the best way to tackle with all of this is through poetry. Um, and uh, in a way, being isolated and being in these circumstances, the only thing that, one of the main things that can help us is the idea of poetry in a more sublime expression. I suppose that this is somehow the best way of what we can get from it. I don't know whether it's the right answer, or is it even a good one, but I guess it's what the book is somehow suggesting. Uh, Do you think it's just suggesting that about poetry specifically or any kind of writing or creative expression? Well, I suppose the poetry is about, uh -huh. you know. In, in a broad in, sense. In a broad sense, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's, that's uh, what I guess might be my, my approach to that. And that's pretty much like cholera, how to deal with poetry in the time of cholera or difficulty. I'll, I'll pivot off that because I think that um, there are several answers to that question. There are several things that I've taken from reading these texts in our current moment. Um, I'd like to think about some of the social implications of this down the road, but I think we need to talk through those implications a little bit more in the texts before I give my answer. So I'll point to that sort of a, hopefully we can pick that up. Um, one of the things that I think, especially level of the time the caller really emphasizes is um, mortality, right? So both cholera as the disease that brings about mortality, but also cholera as a metaphor, you know, cholera is used as a euphemism for the violence. And this goes back to the idea, we talked about violence earlier on. And, um, you know, there's, there's a scene where they're passing on this ship uh, through this area and there's all these bodies that can be seen from the shore. And uh, they ask, you know, well, how they die? And they said, oh, cholera. And he says, oh, it's fascinating. Cholera, there's, gun, there's bullet holes in the backs of all of their heads, right? So there's this idea that cholera just becomes this placeholder for death. Um, but that also fits into um, aging. And, and uh, Omar has already talked about this kind of the aging body. Um, um, Florentino is worried that he's going to die before he can finally you know, consummate his love with Fermina. And then there's these beautiful reflections on aging and love uh, at the end of the text. Um, in fact, at one point, it says there's a line that, um, well, actually, I'll quote it really quickly since we're talking about um, we're doing passage. We haven't quoted from the novel, and I don't, I apologize, I'm reading it in English. You all have heard my Spanish already. So, uh, but there's this moment when Fermina Daza and Florentino Riza are finally on the boat together, and they finally come together after all this time. And um, it says, and this is re really close to the end of the book, it says, it was as if they had leapt over the arduous cavalry of conjugal love and gone straight to the heart of love. They were together in silence like an old merry couple wary of life, beyond the pitfalls of passion, beyond the brutal mockery of hope and the phantoms of disillusion, beyond love, which is itself an interesting phrase given the, all that's been happening at this point. Mm -hmm. For they had lived together long enough to know that love was always love, any time and any place, but it was more solid the closer it came to death. And I find that a kind of fascinating form, like kind of crystallization of this relationship between mortality and love that the book is, is constantly coming back to. And, and sometimes that mortality is violent. And sometimes that mortality is, is evil. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, um, there are people that are murdered for love and committing suicide for love in this text. Um, but I, I do think that like confronting the relationship between the fact that those we love are going to die and are mortal, right? Yeah. Um, plagues make us see that in a new way and I think that there is some something to be gained from that so that would be one one insight I would offer the violence and, and the violence is really important because this episode that you're referring to has to do with the banana <coughs> of 1920 and those bodies are the the ones that were like part of it so and, and 
and, and the government did a cover up of that and the way the cover up was like saying they did it perhaps they died because of cholera and not because we actually shoot them that's even better so it's even more political corruption right yeah uh, yeah 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 i find it striking that there's a there's a character that's named love right J jeremiah saint amour right yeah, and yeah. It's suicide uh apparently yeah. because he doesn't want to become old he's like 60 years exactly. old he doesn't want to because, live any longer. Because, yeah, because your old age is like a main issue for everybody there you know like yeah right so yeah i find this kind of uh this juxtaposition of uh of love and uh and aging to be really interesting i was wondering if you had any further thoughts about like the symbolism of of that sorry are you addressing omar are you addressing me or both well, of any, us? Anyone, anyone i guess I, specifically omar i would think but uh it's just an open question. Yeah. What are we to make of this suicide by this character who is literally named love and doesn't want to get any older? I, uh, I think like, and this has to do with one of the main themes in Garcia Marquez's work, but also in his personal life, he was surrounded by dementia all the time. I think actually I'm, I'm working on a, on a paper right now about the way dementia is the tr is the thing that triggers all this magic realism because of the dialogue he has with the grand her, his grandmother all of this fantastic story this confusion between reality and this forgetfulness and everything but historically in his family his grandmother his mother and all of them including himself died from dementia mm -hmm. so he was dealing with that and that idea of when you get old you get dementia and that's why another explanation for the pandemic, the insomnia pandemic, and all this for, for, for is, is, is it, the whole thing is behind this this passage. Um, so he's scared of, you know, getting old and forgetting and losing everything. So that is reflected in the characters throughout the books, and, and in, in particular in this one, not only with the one who commits suicide, but even the doctor, who is about to die because of this fatal accident is already showing signs of that and writing notes and losing the papers in which here and 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 even uh, not being able to dress himself <laughs> so so i guess this, this is very important as a as another metaphor of the color <laughs> we can't hear you phil i think you're muted can you hear me Yes, we can. I've got a question from Julie Hutzler. Hi, Julie, an old friend of mine. Um, but Julie doesn't have a mic, so I have to read the question for her. Um, Julie asks, as literary people, I would be very interested if you have a metaphor for the coronavirus and what it can be for us. What occurs to me instantly is um, closetedness, since we can't leave, right? Since we're stuck in our homes. Um, but I see that as having a um, narrow application. What do the rest of you think? I don't know. I think uh, time might tell as the situation goes on what the kind of prevailing metaphor becomes. Uh, that often happens with disease, but that can lead us to, into dangerous territory. Like, you know, the Spanish flu, uh, you know, that did not only affect people in Spain, and th this can lead us into territory of stereotyping and such. I know that's not where the question was coming from, but it's a thought that occurs to me, and we've already seen some, we've already seen some uh, kind of bigoted language, you know, people calling it the Wuhan virus and things like that. Uh, it's not exactly a metaphor, but it kind of trends in that territory, and the CDC itself uh, kind of recommends avoiding the use of, not, maybe not metaphor, but geographic language in the naming of diseases, but that often works its way into metaphors. That, that's a thought that occurs to me uh, at this point. Now, now coronavirus, coronavirus is itself a metaphor mm -hmm. because under magnification, it seems to have a corona, right? Right. Yeah. So I guess 
one easy one, one easy metaphor would be like the Zoom pandemic or something, because we are using more of this tool. <laughs> yeah. So I guess in the Sp during the Spanish flu or during other mm -hmm. pandemic, they didn't have any chance to communicate the way we are communicating now. That makes this completely different and special, even for lab purposes, if you understand what I mean. So I've heard people now referring to Generation Z as Generation Zoom. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, that, and then that interest, there's another, that's an interesting link too, to um, the modernization that Omar mentioned in Love in the Time of Cholera, because there's also a, a persistent number of new communication technologies, like cinema, the typewriter, um, the radio, the phonograph. Yeah. So that's an interesting, the, the extent to which um, infrastructure and technology mediates these kind of natural disasters, right? But I, I, I want to actually, um, I, I love Julie's question. I'm not smart enough to give a metaphor, but I actually want to suggest that you tune in next week because that's what next week's discussion is really mm -hmm. going to be about. Because Susan Sontag's essay, AIDS and its Metaphors, which is really a follow-up to her previous essay, Illness and its Metaphors, is really looking at how do we meta make metaphors for illness and what does that enable and what does that limit? Um, so I'm, I, I, I actually was thinking of this as someone who's kind of participating in both conversations. I was thinking of this week as being about using disease as metaphor for other things. And then next week, we're going to be thinking about the way metaphor is a way in which you can contain or shape disease. And the one that the one I'll point out um, is, which I, I think is striking, is the metaphor of our response to the disease. So you've heard things like waging war against the coronavirus and commentators have pointed out, you know, what happens when we deploy that kind of metaphor? Is that really the appropriate kind of metaphor? for something that is infecting so many of us, right? I, I think it's, a, I think it's, I think that's how I would start answering the question, but I, I don't have a good metaphor for coronavirus yet. I think it's difficult when you're in the middle of it. Was that Michael? I think it's difficult when you're in the middle of it. I, I think often the metaphors kind of come about after the fact, oftentimes. And I can't help but hear, uh, I've seen a number of um, creative writers on social media say, please, you know, the coronavirus is going to lead to a wave of really bad coronavirus memoirs and auto fiction, and probably most of them we will not need, right? But people, but people, you know, I'm not saying stop writing your memoir. You, you can't help it when you're in the moment. It can be a very productive um, uh, way to process. I think, uh, you know, I'm keeping a journal, just a crude, you know, here's what happened today journal, because I think it's important for us to capture the experience. But I agree with Michael. I think sometimes our capacity to actually understand or grasp the meaning of the experience can't happen in the moment or will happen down the road. Pat Cornett would like to join the discussion. I'm sure she's going to have something to say about love in the time of cholera. Pat? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I was just typing my response um, about love in the time of cholera. Um, uh, the point was raised about uh, the beginning of the novel and uh, Saint Amour's suicide. Um, his name, of course, is obviously a rel related it's love. And so at the beginning of the novel, uh, Marquez sets up, I think, uh, not quite a dichotomy, but it's certainly a dialogue between love as a disease, as a mental disorder, as something to be avoided, but I think the whole novel is in fact a pretty positive answer to that question. I think the novel in some ways repudiates what the opening sets up. Um, and I was just typing, for me, I was very struck by the final section of the novel in which uh, Fermina and Florentino find new love and they're old, they have lots of ailments and aches and pains and all of us who are their age or older can understand that very well, believe me. Um, but in spite of that, they discover a different kind of love. It's not the love that uh, Florentino has uh, been uh, searching for among all the women in his life, 
he's what uh, at one point uh, he's called a nocturnal hunter, uh, and he's a great um, great lover of many women. Um, but the love they find is based in some degree uh, upon the lives they've lived separate from each other and the experiences they've had. She with uh, her husband, Urbino, he with the many, many women in his life, I think searching for among those women, the love that he can only find ultimately with Firmino. Um, and I think the novel is in many ways Marquez's affirmative response to the disease of cholera or another epidemic um, and to the devastations caused by cholera. Um, clearly, cholera in the novel, among other things that it is, is a metaphor for love. So there is the element that love is a madness, a disease, but it's also more than that. And I find the ending of the novel quite moving and affirmative. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I, I would like to, I'll, I'll, I'll add something, Pat, to, to what you said that um, reinforces your, your point, it, which is that um, it's interesting that when Florentino starts trying to reestablish his relationship with Fermina, he quickly realizes that he can't refer to the past to woo her. He has to make a clean slate and start with where they are now. And so there's this whole point about where he makes that realization as they're talking. She doesn't want to have anything to do with the past, but she will be open to him in the present. And I think that speaks, it speaks to me to two interesting things about love. Um, that have been haunting our discussion. One is its temporality, right? So in the sense that love is both this kind of disruptive eruption that promises an unknown future, right? When you fall in love with someone or you have this romantic encounter with someone, there's a sense in which you are now changed and your future will be different and you're not sure what it will be. But at the same time, love can also be this kind of um, extended temporality, right? That, we, that as we go into that future, uh, we acknowledge that we ourselves are also going to change. So what's intriguing is the novel, I think, is, I, to me, I, leave the, I, I agree the ending is beautiful. I still don't know how to read forever the last word of the novel, given everything else about the novel's emphasis on time and death and mortality. But that's, that aside, what's striking is, is the love that, what, what, you're, what you're pointing out is that the love that Florentino and Fermina have at the end is not the same as the love that they had at the beginning. In fact, it can't be because Fermina disavows Florentino because he says, when she sees him at the market, she says, wait a second, I've been in love with an illusion, right? This is not real at all. So, so, his, so his yeah, I've been in love with an illusion also. Exactly, you know, exactly. Was with him for 50 years and she rejects it. She's much more grounded mm -hmm. in reality than he is for a lot of reasons. He's the poet. He's the romantic, and um, but of course they can't. Their their withered bodies are a rejection of whatever there was in the past, um, and so their love is a new love, and it's it's a fleeting love because both of them know whether they state it or not that they're not going to live much longer. Whether it's, and whatever they die of, it probably won't be cholera. I thought the use of the boat as a cholera boat was an absolutely brilliant way to capture that kind of duality. And when uh, Florentino says forever, um, of course that's fantasy. Mm -hmm. But what other answer is he going to give? He now has what he's been waiting for all of his life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is forever in the sense that they can't go back to land because of the. Right. They, they, it's, a, it's a love boat. I thought right. of <laughs> sort of. It, it, <laughs> it, it's also a kind of sheltering in place, right? I, that's, that's one of the ways in which our current moment has made me think of that yeah, novel differently, boat, right? With this wonderful boat captain. It also reminded me of all these cruise boats that were not able to come back to shore. Yeah. 
uh, you know, some of which contained people who had gone on honeymoons and things like that. Who may not be married when they finally get back to shore, right? <laughs> COVID, COVID divorce. Or, or, there's, a, there's a play on words that I've heard. Yeah. Well, and I actually also heard a reference in a, I, I don't know this, this is purely anecdotal, but I heard a comment about people um, having relationships with their roommates, right? So this is another interesting thing where, you know, when you are trapped within a certain person, you know, love the one you're with, you know, we use that language. But I also think it speaks to the, more, more, more generally, I'm interested in the way love has this kind of constant uh, reproductive quality that Socrates stresses, right? And because I, I do think what's interesting about Diotima's conclusion that in that speech is that we don't, we don't get to the, the um, ideal or form of beauty just to sit and contemplate it. We get to the form of beauty so that then we can go on and produce virtuous things, right? So there's this still this like ongoingness, uh, this kind of becoming, uh, which I think is intriguing when we want to think about love. So we have a question from Jonathan Fisher. Jonathan asks, do you believe plague sobers love? And my first reaction, Jonathan, is our second session in this series was on Boccaccio's Decameron. <laughs> And if that was the only thing we had to go on, we would say um, no. But um, we have more than that to go on. So what do you all think? Does plague sober love? Plague soap, sober. Sober. In other words, does plague make the experience of love more grounded? Uh, well, I thought I was taking it in a literal sense. Uh, <laughs> not in, in, in the symposium, not literally. Uh, not sure if I have anything more uh, serious to say, right? I have to think about that more for a second. I, 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 think, I think you have to, by the way, Jonathan Fisher, if it's a Jonathan Fisher I know is my brother-in-law, um, married to my sister whom he loves and whom I love, and I love Jonathan too, and their, uh, their son, Soren. Uh, so we, we haven't actually talked about the different kinds of love much. To be, and I think that makes sense in this particular panel because we're focusing on arrows. Um, but I, I do think you have to, um, stratify that uh and you have to look at this were questions of class of wealth of social relations come into play because on the one hand i think plague and the classical uh Thrasymachus points this out i mean sorry uh thucydides points this out but, but we, um uh, boccaccio puts this out points this out uh the disruption of life as usual can can unleash certain kinds of forces right it can create um, sort of experimental um, um, decadence. It can create a kind of like um, uh, almost a kind of pleasurable chaos on the one hand. But I think that kind of pleasurable chaos is easier to embrace when one is not faced with the immediate exigencies of death, dying, and illness, um, or feeding oneself or making sure that one has, you know, sufficient water and food. So I would say that it can sober and it can also um, intoxicate, right? But it, it, I think that the, the specific historical conditions um, can, will, will adjudicate that, that, that particular um, response. And yet, it, it used to be a commonplace among historians to say that in ages of high infant mortality, parents didn't love their children. You couldn't afford to. And uh, I never believed that. I thought, you know, I think it's likelier that they loved their children and suffered horribly, as so many of them died. And so my inclination is to say, no, I think probably people love the same way, even when life was really, really bad. But the expression itself, could, but the expression could be different, right? And that, now, that would be a different question, right? Um, but in terms of the emotional life and the experience of love, um, the, the boldest claim I've ever heard was the one I just um, repeated, and I always thought it was wrong. Yeah, there's, a, there's another thing that um, so I've been interested in uh, a lot of the, it's fascinating that there's a lot of contemporary political philosophers who are returning to love and trying to um, think love's potential as a political concept, um, which sounds like tremendously romantic, uh, but they're trying to work through the kinds of social relations it can produce. And one of my favorites is uh, the cultural critic, Lauren Berlant. And one of her arguments is that love is the term we give to emotions that are often very ambivalent. 
And by that, she means that on the one hand, we are passionate about the object of our love, but we also recognize that that passion is going to lead to kind of projects and behaviors that are going to be tough, right? That are going to create pain or suffering, right? Uh, it's the, it's the, actually, I'll use my nephew as an example. It's when you're holding the child late at night and you say, I love this thing more than anything, but I could kill it right now because it won't let me sleep, right? That, that kind of ambivalent. Poverty and plenty. Exactly, exactly. And I, I think that that's a really important insight into the fact that love is not only plenitude, right? Love is also deprivation and, and risk, right? And so plague, I think, can catalyze both of those. And hey guys, we've actually come to the end. Well, that's too bad. We were going strong, but uh, thank you, Phil, for. Well, if you want to keep, I don't know if Scott, I don't know if Scott's available, but we've come to eight thirty. Well, so, I would like to thank everyone as the kind of. Um, I guess I'm playing the host, even though this is really Phil's party. So, Phil, thank you again for setting this up, and Michael and Omar, I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. And so uh, I hope everyone will join us next week for the conclusion of this series. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.